Hi friends, and welcome to this week's episode. You know, if you're anything like me, I get overwhelmed with all the information out there. Those of you who watch YouTube videos or listen to podcasts probably don't just listen to this one. I have a whole library of really great speakers that I love to listen to, you know, in the health, wellness, longevity space. Many of you are the same. And sometimes it just seems like too much. I was just thinking about that the other day, like, oh, good grief. Like now I've got to get 15 minutes of low angle sunlight twice a day and add that to the list of things. And that's a great idea, by the way, but at some point it can get a little bit overwhelming. Many of us make one video about one particular topic and that's all really useful. But anyway, what I'm going to try to do today is kind of summarize maybe some of the most important things because many of us get sort of stuck in the weeds and it seems like so much to do that it's just impossible to start. So my suggestion is if we can sort of break it down and I organize my mind this way. So I've broken it down into kind of 10 categories, which still is a lot. I'm sorry, I couldn't make it fewer than 10. You don't have to do each one perfectly. It's not like that. But if we could do a little bit out of each one, just start with the low hanging fruit. That would be a really good place to start. We're not trying to be perfect at anything. It's impossible unless you had nothing else to do. You know, some of these really fantastic longevity gurus do have nothing else to do and that's great and you might be one. So by all means, you could go into the weeds on any one of these topics, but I'm gonna try to just sort of high level it a little bit just so that we can kind of keep together what it is that we're trying to do to optimize our health in the second half of life. Okay, so let's give it a try. And this is going to sound a lot like a broken record for a little while, but number one, and these are not in order of importance, there are a ton of things. The first one that comes to mind is regarding body composition slash nutrition. And yes, we all know this, but If we don't get that part under control, it's gonna be really difficult for any of the other things to work. So again, we don't have to weigh a certain amount. Nobody's suggesting that everybody has to weigh 120 pounds or anything of that nature, but body composition, nutrition, that's where everything starts from. So just let's think about what the basics are regarding nutrition. And there are about a hundred thousand different books with different names about what to eat and when to eat and how much of this, that, and the other, but breaking it down into the most simple things that are generally agreed upon by just about everybody for a woman our age, high protein, low carb, low sugar, limited or no alcohol. So let's just stick with those very basic four ideas, and then digging into those each a little bit more. What do we mean by high protein? Well, if we are going to maintain and build muscle, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more with number two, because that is one of the most important things that's associated with longevity. We need to forget the recommended daily amount from the United States government of 0.8 grams of protein per kilo. That's about half what we need about one gram of protein per ideal body weight. Now, when it gets over about 120 grams, that becomes very difficult. So I I often tell patients one gram per ideal body weight up to about 120 grams. Now, if you're like some of my patients who are really trying to build a lot of muscle, maybe 140 grams. So for me, that's about 120 grams of protein a day. That is really a lot of work for me to do. If I get up in the morning and just go about my business and don't think about it, I would get less than half of that. So number one on the number one list, (laughs) 1.1, is just do an inventory of your protein intake. Make sure you're getting at least 100 grams of protein a day, 120 if you can, and that would solve the great majority of issues regarding weight maintenance, muscle maintenance, because Protein takes more work just to metabolize, so it takes more energy to burn it. If we eat our protein first, I don't really have any room for the carbohydrate element or the sugar because I'm full. 120 grams of protein a day is a lot to take in. So in my case, at least 40 of that usually comes in the form of a supplement. And then if you eat animal products, you know, about six ounces of meat, fish, or chicken is about 40 grams 
So you can imagine getting to 120 takes some thought, but it is worth it. That is the number 1.1 thing on the list. So getting adequate protein and just put some time into thinking about it and making sure that you're getting it and make that a commitment. And if you can't commit to much else, that would be a really good thing to start with. Okay, so you could be a vegan, you could be on any sort of diet whatsoever, protein doesn't much matter where it comes from, but there is some emerging science indicating that we can't eat it all at once. So it would be hard to do, but sitting down and eating 100 grams of protein at once, we cannot absorb that much. So it seems to be the best idea to break it into say 20 or 30 grams times four or five. So for example, you know, if you had a 30 gram protein shake, and then a piece of salmon, and then a couple of other things, you're gonna to get to that number. So trying to eat you know, 50 or 60 grams at once, very likely that's gonna be burned as fuel and it won't be available to build muscle, for example. So we don't wanna to get too into the weeds with that, but protein, 1.1, most important on that list. And then decreasing carbohydrates, not to zero if you're an active person. We need carbohydrates, we need energy but lowering carbohydrates, especially, of course, the processed, refined kind. Like, we all know this by now, right? Brown stuff's better than white stuff. Anything in a package that's got ingredients with long names. No, just foods that are found in nature. And if I try to cut my carb content down to pretty much zero, I'm still getting it in, in my plants, um, in my vegetables, and fruit. So you can't get carbohydrates down to zero unless you're on a carnivore diet, and I don't think that's healthy for your lipid panel. So lowering carbohydrates, and then consider pretty much eliminating sugar in the refined version. Now, you know, I like a piece of chocolate now and then, but putting sugar in anything or anything that we know is made with sugar, you know, I don't, I don't ever think we need to be 100% perfect, but just maybe considering that is not ever part of a healthy, person's diet in the second half of life, except on very special occasions. You know, we could tolerate it when we were in our 20s, but uh, it's just not good for so many reasons, not just for weight, but also for diabetes, uh, pre-diabetes like insulin resistance, even elevating our lipid profile if we're eating a bunch of refined carbohydrates and sugar, just better to get rid of it. And then the fourth thing in the nutrition bucket is alcohol. And I've talked about alcohol before and about my own journeys with limiting alcohol. Just do it. <laughs> There's nothing good about alcohol except that it tastes good. I know it's socially fun and all of those things, but unless you're in the very rare group that truly can have one five ounce glass of wine a week, and, and I'm not in that group. That's very difficult for me to do. Just think about getting rid of it. I, you've enjoyed it all these years. Is it really helping you? I had to ask myself those questions. What am I getting out of this alcohol? Well, a headache, a hangover, a bunch of sugar, de decreased and reduced quality of sleep. Yeah, that's my answer to that question. You know, it doesn't do anything good for us. So we really need to look at our alcohol consumption. And I made a video about that earlier if you wanted to look at that a little bit more. For women, if you continue with alcohol, one drink is five ounces of wine. And I showed you in the last video, I did that experiment. And that's a very small glass of wine or one ounce of liquor. And so more than seven drinks a week is associated with all kinds of bad stuff, um, not including bad behavior and accidents and not being nice to your partner and other things like that, but also cancer, um, including breast cancer, not just liver cancer and GI cancers, but anyway, bad stuff. Yeah, you know, just think about it. Is it worth it? I mean, I have a wine cellar in my house. Um, wine's been an important part of my life for a long, long time, but I've really had to think about that. So, that's enough getting into the weeds with nutrition. We all know this. Um, I'll just add one more little comment. If you wanted to go more into the weeds, again, you could just stop listening to the nutrition part right here. Lots of pros and cons about fasting. People have different opinions about it. Um, time restricted eating, which is what we call just eating at certain times of the day, you know, for example, from 12 to six or whatever you choose. Uh, that's not really fasting. So the, the nomenclature around that would be time restricted eating 
if you're just eating for a certain time during the day, you know, there's some evidence that that reduces the total calories that we're getting. Um, it may make us not think about food as much. We don't really get into that, what we call autophagy state, where our gut is actually repairing itself until we do much longer fasts. And so maybe there is some benefit to doing a weekly 24-hour fast, you know, maybe don't eat from dinner on Sunday till dinner on Monday, or even longer, 36 hours. I'm just going to leave that as a different topic because that is really getting into the weeds. But yeah, there's some science that that could be helpful for some people for weight loss, for repairing our gut health. Um, but I'm just going to stick with those four things. Protein, decreasing carbs and sugar, and alcohol. So that's enough on that topic because it can just get way too much. And so then we don't do anything and drink water. <laughs> okay, but too many things. All right, number two on my list of things to do, and we kind of hinted at it already. It is so important to have adequate muscle mass, especially as we get older. So it's vital if you want to be healthy and live a long, healthy life without disease to do resistance training. And I know we all know this already, right? So first of all, we've got to provide our muscles with protein in order to be able to build. So if we're trying to build muscle, eating protein is critical. And then we've got to use our muscles. So why do we care about muscle mass? Well, it's associated with so many good things. So people with more muscle mass as they get older have a lower incidence of all kinds of diseases and not just the obvious ones, you know, like heart disease, diabetes, that would make sense. But also things like osteoporosis, we don't fall down. And when we do, our bones are stronger because we've been using our muscles, we've got better balance, so we don't trip in the first place. And then even associated with reduction in certain cancers and very exciting, Alzheimer's disease. So we've talked about that before. Having high muscle mass is associated with a reduction in neurologic decline. So if we're gonna live long enough, and now we're planning to do that, we really gotta think about why that's so important. And just going back to the basics, if I'm 56 as I am now, I need to go into the later two decades of my life with more than adequate muscle because I will lose some. We're all going to lose muscle as we get older, especially after 70, 75, it starts to decline because we get older. We're not able to lift the weights we used to be able to lift. We're not able to do as much activity as we used to. So it really behooves us to go into our 60s, 70s with extra muscle mass. So at my age, I want to have way more muscle than average because I'm going to lose some. So we need to put some in the bank, so to speak. So if we're not lifting weights and doing strength training when we're in our 50s, we are not going to have an optimal later decade of life. I'll just tell you that's pretty much 100% the case. And you have to think about what is it that you want to be doing when you're 85 or 90. Uh, yeah, I don't need to be doing Ironman triathlons anymore, but I do want to be able to walk through the airport. I want to carry my own suitcase. I want to be able to get up and down off the ground. I want to be able to walk up a hill if I'm on vacation. I want to be able to play with my grandkids. I want to, you know, just be able to be independent at home, doing basic daily life activities, walking up and down my stairs and things like that. So we've got to have really good muscle mass to be able to do those things. And as you know, the majority of elderly people, and I'll just say people in their 80s and on, are quite limited in what they're able to do. If you've been on a plane lately, and I travel a lot, there are not many people traveling in their 80s and older, and those that are, are in that line waiting for a wheelchair. I don't want to be one of those people in the line waiting for a wheelchair. You know what I mean? So bless them uh, that they're still traveling, but they didn't know what we knew when, when they were in their 50s, I'll just surmise, or at least they didn't do it. Um, or perhaps they have other injuries and things. I don't mean to generalize, but we want to be the ones that can do that on our own. So having muscle mass is critical. It does not happen on its own. Testosterone doesn't make it happen on its own. Eating protein doesn't make it happen on its own. We've got to lift some weight. Now, it doesn't have to be weights at the gym, although that's a very good idea. You know, of course, some of the healthiest people in the world live in countries where they would never think about going to the gym because their weightlifting is carrying a bale of hay up a hill every day. Now, we don't do that anymore. Most of us don't. Uh, you might put a backpack full of rocks on your back and walk up and down a hill, or you might go to the gym like me. And the key is that we want to be doing weights that are heavy enough 
that were sore the next day. That's a little guideline that I use. So if I'm doing 35 pound weights uh, for a bicep curl, um, my trainer calls that bike dancing if I'm doing it on a bike. <laughs> yeah, it's fun, it's cardio. It's not going to build muscle. What we want to do is shorter sets of heavier weights. Not enough to injure yourself, but if you can complete 10 to 12, you need to increase the weight. So, you know, three sets, very easy. Get a trainer, they'll go over that in more detail, but you cannot do it without some type of resistance training. Now you can use your own body. There are lots of exercises you can do without weights, using your own body weight, using furniture, using the wall. Uh, but in order to build new muscle, we've got to break the old muscle down. So in my uh, easy way of thinking about things, if I've done my workout and my arms are sore the next day or my legs, whatever body part I was working on, then I'm in a good spot. Because if they're not sore, I didn't create those little micro tears that cause the muscle to rebuild. So muscle mass is critical. And cardiovascular exercise is too. So there's two components. There are many. We also want to think about balance and posture and flexibility. But cardiovascular exercise, something that gets our heart rate up, like walking fast, jogging, bike, anything that you like to do, and weight training, and split it about 50-50. And that might be 30 minutes a day or longer. And ironically, the older we get, the more we have to do because nature is pulling our muscle down. So sounds like a lot, but it just becomes part of your healthy lifestyle. So that's super important. You just cannot be a healthy elderly person without doing it. You cannot. Um, you've got to do it if you want to achieve that goal. Number three, also in the really necessary things is sleep. And you, we've talked a lot about sleep here because I'm a very accomplished insomniac. And so I have done everything under the sun to help with sleep. And I do, for the most part, sleep well now. So why is sleep so important? Well, it might sound obvious, but let's just go over it again. We truly do need to sleep for seven to nine hours a night. We do. And people who sleep less than that, there may be some rare ones who can not suffer consequences of not sleeping enough, but seven to nine hours a night is critical. And so we need to set up our lives to make that a priority. For me, sleep is possibly the most important time of the day. So I've done a lot of things to try to sleep better. And is it always perfect? No, but it's certainly a lot better. So without getting too much in the weeds, because you could go way in the weeds about all the ways to sleep better, very simple things. And most of us know this already. Keeping our room cold and by cold 65 to 68 degrees, keeping it dark. And by that, I mean dark. Like if you cannot make it dark because you've got uh, neighbors with a light shining in the window or little bright lights from all your various um, electrical toys, take them out of the room. And if you can't do that, get a shade on your eyes. It's light coming into your eyes that causes the sleep disruption. So our body was trained to wake up when it's light and go to sleep when it's dark. And restoring that circadian rhythm is really important. So very dark and cold. So in the temperature idea, there's some other really good science, and I do this myself, that getting hot right before bed, and that could be as simple as taking a hot bath. That's what I do. Other people use saunas and all kinds of things. But if you have a bath, or even if you don't have a bath, a very hot shower, hot. Now, many people say 104 degrees, which I personally find that intolerable, but really hot bath, like as hot as I can. And I hang out in there for about 20 minutes. The, the point is that we're trying to elevate your body temperature and then let it drop. And that drop in body temperature is one of the signals that causes us not only to go to sleep, but to stay asleep. So that's the logic behind the cold room. Now you can be covered in blankets. You can even have a hot water bottle, but it's the ambient temperature that seems to be what's exposed to our head that seems to be important in that regard. So elevating your body temperature before bed with a nice hot shower or bath. And we've known this for years, right? It's lovely to take a bath and it helps you relax and go to sleep. But that's science now really shows that that's true. And then cold, dark room, of course, goes without saying, get the blue light out of your room, no phones in the room blue light glasses if you have to do that, but maybe just don't. And then, you know, there's a million meditation sleep apps. I'm not gonna get all into the weeds about that. Um, but another uh, 
something that I'll talk about in a moment regarding supplements. As we get older and our hormones are depleted, our brains change in such a way that it is more difficult to sleep. So taking supplements or and or hormones that help us sleep, I'll get into that shortly. I do all of that. I take five things to sleep. And then measuring your sleep is really useful too. And I've talked many, many times about my Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. There's other devices that do the similar thing. A Whoop Band, your Apple Watch will do it. There are other devices out there too. But in some way, being able to monitor not only how many hours you're sleeping, because you could say, well, I know when I go to sleep and when I wake up and I can count. Well, yes, but we don't know how much deep sleep and REM sleep we're getting, how many times we're waking up. Uh, what our lowest heart rate is, what our heart rate variability is. These are all really important data pieces that these devices can pick up. And it's very educational because you can see trends. For example, in my case, if I drink wine or eat sugar, I will have terrible deep sleep and REM sleep. It obliterates both of those, um, just does. Or if I am too hot because the room's too hot. Or if my hormones are depleted, I'm having hot flashes or if I don't take my progesterone, or a number of different things. So this will give you information that's actually actionable. You can, you can look at it and learn lessons like don't eat sugar and drink wine two hours before bed, or your deep and REM sleep will be destroyed <laughs> in my case. So, or if you do those things, you know you're going to have a bad sleep. So you can mindfully do those things on occasion if you want to, but understanding what's going to happen. And it's the deep sleep component in which we, our brain cleans itself, for want of a better word, it gets rid of the old cells, replaces it with new cells. So not getting good sleep, and alcohol actually disrupts REM sleep, the dreaming part of sleep, that's also very necessary for emotional stability and other things. When those two types of sleep are disrupted by alcohol, sugar, you name it, it increases the risk not only of being grumpy, having sugar cravings, our cortisol goes up, so we go into fat storing mode, but also lends to neurologic decline when we're older. So there's so many reasons why sleeping well is a good idea, not just because you feel better the next day, but hey, that's good. But a lot of long-term benefits from it as well. So our patients that come to see me are struggling with weight loss, frequently one of the really important pieces to fix is sleep. Uh, because without a doubt, not sleeping well causes us to gain weight for those reasons that I mentioned. Some of it's behavioral. Uh, we crave sugar when we don't sleep well. We don't wanna work out because we're grumpy. We tend not to move as much the next day. And then also just our hormones change in a way that lends to fat storage. Uh, so that's not what we want. So sleep, that's my number three on the simplified list of stuff we should all be doing. Number four, just looking at some really important numbers, we used to talk about what are your numbers, right? What's your, what's your cholesterol? What's your blood pressure? What's your weight? I would extend that a little bit more. We do a um, really comprehensive lab panel in our office and your doctor might do something similar. Uh, but you're really looking at, let's just talk about those basic things like blood pressure and your lipid panel and your sugar numbers, and, as well as kidney, liver function, your complete blood count, all of the basic things, vitamin status, lots of things. We need to keep those optimal uh, because they lend to less disease when they're optimal. So that sounds basic. As you know, the most common thing that we're going to die from as men and women is heart disease. So what are some of the biggest risk factors for heart disease? I'm just going to assume that none of us listening here smoke. So if you smoke, you just got to stop. That's just a deal breaker. That's a Huge, massive risk factor for so many things, including heart disease. So we'll just assume you already don't smoke. I'm not even going to count that one. Elevated blood pressure. And so when I was in med school, we said 140 over 90. So you get these two numbers, right? One of them is called systolic. That's the top number. Diastolic is the bottom number. That's basically measuring the pressure of the blood going through your blood vessels when your heart is pumping. That's the high number. And when it's relaxing, that's the low number. So we were taught back in the old days, 140 over 90 was okay and then anything under that. Well, actually now we've really tightened up on that. So 130 would be the highest and 80 on the bottom. So we really wanna keep your numbers 130 over 80 or lower 
because the numbers even slightly elevated, 130s over 80s, which I would have previously called normal, does increase the risk of heart disease because it damages the inside of our blood vessels. So I always think about a hose, a tube, if you're an engineer, a pipe. If you're blowing high pressure fluid through that pipe for 80, 90 years, you're going to damage it, right? So we want to reduce the pressure going through the pipe and we want to reduce it as much as possible without becoming symptomatic. So when blood pressure is too low, of course, that's not good. You stand up and you feel faint because you can't get blood to your brain. So we don't want it to be 80 over 40, uh, but you know, keeping it in a very tight range and not accepting that your blood pressure is just a little bit high. Uh, that's like being a little bit pregnant or smoking a little bit. <laughs> um, this is something that happens all the time. I'll have patients come into my office and we check their blood pressure and it's um, 145 over 95. And they'll frequently say, oh, well, it's always normal. This is just because I'm stressed or I couldn't find a parking spot. It doesn't matter why. <laughs> so I, unless it's just the only time in your life it's been high, if it's high when you're stressed or high when you can't find a parking spot or high for any reason at all, your blood vessels don't care why. They just know that it's high. So don't blow that off. If it's high, it's high. And then go home and get a blood pressure cuff on your own and monitor at home and then treat it. Uh, we really want to have blood pressure in a good range. So that's one, one number we need to know. Other numbers we already talked about regarding body composition, we want high muscle mass, low body fat, by low body fat, I mean for women, less than 30% of our total weight should be body fat, particularly the kind around the middle. So we can measure visceral fat with a DEXA scan. I made a video about that earlier. We really want visceral fat to be zero-ish, like less than a pound. Doesn't much matter how much you have under your skin, it's the stuff inside your abdomen that causes disease. So low body fat, less than 30% of our total weight with minimal or no visceral body fat would be great. And then muscle mass as high as possible. So for someone like me, I'm five foot six. I have, I think something like 55, 56 pounds of muscle. That's a good amount for somebody my height. Um, but we don't wanna have very low muscle mass. And the only way to know that is to get on a machine that measures it. So I highly recommend doing that at least once a year. So other numbers that are critical, we've talked quite a bit here about the lipid panel and the way we look at it now, not talking about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol because there's only one kind of cholesterol. It's just the way it's packaged, the certain type that we call LDL or low density lipoprotein is the kind that very long story short might stick onto your blood vessels and cause problems. So we want that particular package to be lower. The HDL is more involved in transporting that back to the liver to be excreted, but neither one is good or bad. So we often measure this thing called ApoB. As you remember, ApoB is attached to the outside of these little LDL particles. So you can actually count how many you have. And it turns out the particle count rather than the concentration of LDL, which is what you usually see on a normal report, is more indicative of your risk of heart disease. So knowing your ApoB, we want ApoB to be as low as possible, not what the lab says, but 80 or lower or even 60s is great, like as low as possible. That's a good one to know. And then of course, all the other general wellness stuff just to keep an eye on because as we get older, often we see our blood sugar going up. That one's critical. We don't wanna wait till you're diabetic before we do something or even pre-diabetic. So many of you have seen on a lab, we check some things like fasting insulin, which should be low because we don't produce insulin any tiny bit when you're fasting, but shouldn't be producing lots of insulin when you're fasting. If you are, that means you're what we call insulin resistant, which is pre-diabetic condition or type two diabetes would also show up that way. And then we want your fasting sugar to be not less than 110, like some labs say, really less than 90 would be great. And then that thing called hemoglobin A1C, which is a calculation of, the lab is guessing what your average blood sugar has been for the past three months. It's, it's not a direct calculation because of course it can't see the past, but we really want that to be something like 5%. So there's a continuum. And if it's 6.5, we say you're diabetic. 5.7, we say you're pre-diabetic. 
below that, many people just say you're normal, but that's not really the case. I mean, if it's creeping up and it's getting higher every year and it was 5.1, now it's 5.3, now it's 5.5, that's something that we want to intervene. And that's done with, guess what? Nutrition, cutting out sugar, increasing exercise. So it's kind of sounding like a broken record. I know if we just ate less sugar and exercised, that would cure the great majority of type two diabetes. It, it just is a fact. <laughs> now, of course, many of us have a genetic predisposition and that is a factor, but we don't have to turn the key just because we have the gene. We can alter that outcome with lifestyle changes in most cases, medication if lifestyle changes don't work. So that sugar number is really important to know. So there's lots of other numbers too, and I'm not even gonna talk about hormones here and all the weeds about that. Um, but regarding your numbers, we should know our numbers. You should know what your ApoB is, what your LDL is, what your blood pressure is, what your fasting sugar, insulin, hemoglobin A1C are, as well as other basic labs. And again, I'm not getting too much in the weeds because there's so many different labs that you could do, genetic testing, all kinds of things we can talk about a different day. Just those basic things. That's enough to swallow for now. So that brings me to number five, which is preventative screening. So I'm all about preventative medicine. I know you are too, if you're listening to me. There are certain screening tests that are just low hanging fruit that, that we should just do. You just gotta put them on your calendar. I know it's a giant hassle, but they can prevent us not from necessarily getting a disease, but pick it up very, very early so that we can treat it before it becomes a problem. Let's start with the most basic ones, mammography. So breast cancer, one in eight of us will get breast cancer during our lifetime. Mammography is minimal radiation. I hear all the time, oh, isn't it too much radiation? It'll cause me to get leukemia. No, <laughs> mammograms are very low amount of radiation. Certainly you could have one or two or three every single year for the rest of your life and it wouldn't come close to the amount of radiation that would cause a problem. So that is a false idea. So mammography now is really quite advanced. What we do now is called 3D mammography, which actually is just taking a couple of extra pictures so that the radiologist can feed it into a program and look at it in a three-dimensional manner. It's a, allowed the ability to pick up things that previously might have been missed. So if you have a normal mammogram, especially if you have an opportunity to have a 3D mammogram, the chances that they'll miss something is not zero but it's extraordinarily low. And if you get one every year, the chances that something would be missed repetitively is really approaching close to zero. So these days, if you get re regular mammography, the chances that you would have a cancer that spreads outside the breast is very close to zero, which is so exciting. So with very few exceptions, we should not die from breast cancer anymore because it can be caught early on a mammogram. So when do you start getting them? Different organizations have different recommendations. Generally in gynecology world, we say 50 or earlier if you have additional risk factors for breast cancer, because certainly we get breast cancer before 50. So you can feel your own breasts regularly starting at 30 and get examined by mammogram or ultrasound whenever you feel something. Your doctor should do that at your annual exam as well. And then definitely get an annual mammogram. You know, usually I say that my patients over 40 um, and then absolutely after 50 because the risk does go up after 50. There is an interesting recommendation not to do mammography anymore over 75, which I think is a little bit comical, is if you're just gonna die soon anyway, so what's the point in getting a mammogram? I ignore that for sure. If we're gonna live possibly to be 100, absolutely you could get breast cancer when you're 80, 85, 90 and be treated and be totally fine. So if anyone tells you not to get a mammogram because you're 76, I would find another doctor. That, that recommendation makes zero sense. So mammogram. Let's talk about pap smears. So pap smears are a screening tests for cervical cancer. As most of you know, cervical cancer is pretty much 100% caused by a virus called HPV, human papillomavirus different than HSV, that's herpes simplex virus, so many people get them confused. But HPV, there are lots of them, they've got all these numbers. Uh, certain types of HPV, uh, particularly type 16 and 18, and then a couple of higher number ones, have a higher association with cervical cancer than some other types like 6 and 11, 
none of this matters except that there are certain types that are more likely associated with cervical cancer. So when you have a pap smear, we check for those. And if you don't have any of those types of HPV that are considered to be risky for cervical cancer, you don't need to have a pap smear every year because you won't get cervical cancer. You can just take that off your list of things to worry about unless you have a new sexual partner. So if you've been HPV negative all your life and then you get divorced and have a new boyfriend, you need to start screening again because that could change. Most of the time, HPV goes away on its own. So with few exceptions, we just observe it, occasionally do a little biopsy. But again, we should not ever die from cervical cancer because it can be picked up so early, way before it's even cancer and treated. But you don't need to do it every single year if you're HPV negative and there's no way that would change. Now, a little caveat is when we started telling patients they don't need a pap smear every year, the American College of OBGYN says every three to five years, People took that and thought, well, I don't need to come in at all. Well, no, still come in. You still need an annual exam because we want to check your ovaries, uterus, bladder, vagina, rectum, breasts, everything else, bone health, hormone health, on the million things. You just don't need a pap smear. So I still come in every year, though. So mammogram, pap smear, colonoscopy. Now, nobody wants one of those. It's really not that bad. Um, I think I've told this story before. I quite enjoyed mine. I've had a couple. Um you drink this stuff the night before the procedure and evacuates your bowel, and that's not a lot of fun, but it's pretty quick. And then you get a lovely, relaxing anesthetic and wake up and it's over. I found mine to be quite pleasant. I had a nice, enjoyable day off. And then I found out that I had a little polyp, and so I had to have another one three years later. So the thing about colonoscopy is it's truly the only way that can look at your entire colon and then treat something at the same time if they see something. So there were other non-invasive tests like Cologuard, for example, that uh, looks for the DNA that's associated with colon cancer from a stool sample. Well, the problem is it can't treat polyps or remove them. So I still recommend getting a colonoscopy. It's not that big of a deal. And it gets you all the information you need. And then if they see something, they can biopsy and treat it at the same time. So the recommendations now are to start that at 45 or earlier if you have a family history. We used to say 50 to 55, but because colon cancer is quite common, one in 25 is the risk, which is significant. That's if you don't have a family history. Again, if you're getting colonoscopies, you won't die from colon cancer. I mean, it's kind of a big statement to say, but that's generally true with very few exceptions. It would be caught early, nothing would be missed. So just put that on your calendar. If you have a normal colonoscopy, you don't need another one for 10 years. So that's a worth it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, mammogram, pap smear, colonoscopy, bone density screening for osteoporosis. So current recommendations are to start doing that at 65. We have hardly any patients that we wait until 65 for because the exception to that would be if you have risk factors for osteoporosis and pretty much everybody that I know does. <laughs> If you're a small framed woman, if you have a family history, if you took steroids in the past, certain other diseases, if you're a smoker, if you've had an unexplained fracture, there's a million reasons that puts you into a group that's high enough risk to do it sooner than 65. And frankly, it's a test with pretty much zero radiation. It takes five minutes. It doesn't hurt. So my thought is why the heck not do it? I, I do it right around time of menopause for most of our patients sometimes even a little earlier if they have a lot of those risk factors. And that just establishes what our risk of osteoporosis is so that we can intervene. We can put a fire under all the things that we know are good for bone density. So that's in the why not category. And if it's totally normal, we might not do it for another five years if it's showing some change every couple of years. So that's a really easy thing to do. I get my mammogram, get my bone density down at the same time takes about a whole extra 10 minutes. Very simple and safe and pain-free. And then what about other screening tests? Well, we've talked here quite a bit about calcium scan for the heart. I think that's super important. If I ran the world, that would be mandatory for everybody to do when they're 40. A calcium scan is an x-ray of your heart and it picks up calcifications, if they're present, inside the blood vessels that supply your heart. So if you have calcifications in those blood vessels, you already have pretty advanced heart disease. And hypothetically, if everybody found that out, nobody would ever have a heart attack. So why not screen for the thing that kills us more than anything else? 
again, it's not a significant amount of radiation. It's pain-free. It's relatively inexpensive. So getting a, a calcium score, which is what you would achieve from doing that test, is another really important number. In my opinion, everybody should do it starting at about 40, uh, depending on your family history, maybe even earlier. But even if you have no family history of heart disease, knowing what that is, I think, is really important. So put that on your list of things to do. And then don't forget to go to the dentist. Well, none of us <laughs> want to lose our teeth. But more than that, having periodontal disease, like gum disease, is an independent risk factor for Alzheimer's. Isn't that interesting? So having healthy gums is really important, not just so we keep our teeth, but so we don't get neurological decline. So go to the dentist every year, get your teeth cleaned. That should be on your list. And if you're someone like me who spent way too much time out in the sun, go to the dermatologist as well. So we've got about five or six things that we should do every year. Many of them you can combine together. And it, to me, this is just low hanging fruit because if I have breast cancer, colon cancer, an early melanoma, gum disease, and I don't know about it, I am putting myself at incredibly high risk for diseases later in life that I could completely eliminate just by putting that hour on the calendar and going to get that done. So there's lots of other tests you could do if you wanted to, but those are the ones that we should all do. So mammogram, colonoscopy, bone density, pap smear, dental, dermatologist, <laughs> I'm trying to keep this simple so I won't go into all the other genetic testing and stuff that we could do and total body MRI, you know, you could go way into the weeds on any of these topics as I mentioned, but I'm trying to keep it as high level as I can so that it's manageable because you actually can do all these things without it disrupting your life too much. So we touched on brain health a few times already in what I was talking about today. Uh, but what can we do to protect our brain from neurologic decline? Because it is scary. Many of us have parents who are affected by Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, other types of uh, neurologic decline. And because many of us are going to live a really long time, it's critical to do what we can to protect our brain. So I've talked about some of those things already. Keeping our weight normal, blood pressure normal. For goodness sake, don't smoke. Limit alcohol. Primarily because it affects sleep and sleep, <laughs> so sleep and don't do things that disrupt sleep uh, because sleeping really well is critical to protect our brain. Uh, keeping our blood sugar normal, blood pressure normal, not having diabetes, having good muscle mass, all the things that are sounding like a broken record. And then what else can we do? Well, I'm gonna get into this a little bit more when we talk about supplements, but there is a lot of really powerful advancing science about certain things that can help protect our brain, including magnesium, particularly magnesium three and eight, which is a particular kind that's able to cross the blood brain barrier. Or there are some emerging studies suggesting that magnesium deficiency increases the risk of neurologic decline and taking magnesium three and eight can improve that risk. Another thing is in the list of numbers, I didn't mention this one, knowing your homocysteine level is a really good idea. Homocysteine is a nasty inflammatory marker. We really want it to be low as possible, certainly less than 10, probably less than eight. There's some very compelling studies suggesting that levels greater than 11, homocysteine, are associated with an increased risk of Alzheimer's. And some very compelling studies coming from Oxford in England. These are you know, really good studies suggesting that lowering homocysteine reduces the risk of Alzheimer's by some insane number like 40%. So making sure your homocysteine is low, and I'll tell you how to do that, is critical. So magnesium, all the things I previously mentioned, keeping your homocysteine low. Omega-3s, really interesting. So I have definitely changed my tune about the benefit of omega-3s. I used to think they were kind of, eh, not that important. Uh, they're really important. So as we learn, it's really good to abandon old ideas and adopt new ones. Science is now suggesting that we need a lot of marine-based omega-3. So with all due respect to everybody out there on a vegan diet, it's next to impossible to get enough omega-3 from flaxseed and chia seed and other things that have ALA. So ALA is 
an omega-3, but we're talking about the marine-based omega-3s when we're talking about brain health, so DHA and EPA. You can do a little test, and I highly recommend doing it. I'll put a little link to it below. It's called Omega Quant. So the Omega Quant test is a little card. You can order it online. I would get the cheap one. It's $49. They've got different higher level ones that give more information, but $49 is sufficient. You stick your finger, it's pretty painless, put a little drop of blood on this card and send it off to the Omega Quant company and they will give you a score. And in the United States, the average Omega Omega index, that's just what you get as a result, it's called the Omega-3 index, is less than five, which is really way too low. In countries where they consume a lot of uh, seafood, like Japan and Norway, the average would be closer to 10. So for optimal brain health, heart health, even other things like mood stability, just a number of uh, wellness benefits, we really want our omega index to be eight or higher. And that's quite hard to do. I'll tell you that I now take 2000 milligrams of DPA EHA combined, and I started eating some fish. I've had a plant-based diet for years, but I have added in some fish for this reason and did that for a few months, and my omega index was 8.5, just barely crushed the threshold. So for sure, if you're not doing that, it'll be low. But I think it's good to find out if it's low, um, because in countries where they have a higher omega index, they have fewer diseases, including neurologic decline. So pretty powerful evidence that's growing all the time about the importance of that particular um, nutritional element. Now, if you ate sardines for breakfast, like they do in Norway, or fish all day long, like they may do in Japan, you don't have to take a supplement. So what you could do is just check it, do the Omega Quant, see what your number is. If it's eight or higher, carry on. If it's not, then you need to add something, a supplement and or eating a fatty fish. So just as an example, eating a piece of salmon, standard size six to eight ounces might be a thousand milligrams. So that'd be about half what you need. And I don't know many people who will do that twice a day. <laughs> so then we get into supplementation. But anyway, so regarding brain health, and then of course, using our brain, uh, staying active in ways that require complex movements, um, you know, not just reading a book, it's also really good, uh, or playing chess, also really good, but using our brain in ways that require quick, complex changes, like pickleball, tennis, other active movements. And so people who are more active in those type of uh, fields have a lower incidence of neurologic decline. So that's cool. Um, and then without getting into the weeds, you can do some genetic testing like the APOE gene we've talked about before to see if you are at higher risk of Alzheimer's or not. But regardless of how that test turns out, I would still do all that stuff because a lot of people get Alzheimer's who have normal or low risk APOE readings. And a lot of people don't get Alzheimer's who have the higher risk APOE uh, particular numbers. So that's not the only thing, but it can be useful to find out. So brain health, super important. I want to keep mine working as long as I can. So just as a review, sleep, get rid of alcohol, keep your weight normal, blood sugar normal, blood pressure normal, all the same things you do for your heart. And then plus or minus some supplements depending on what you eat, and then do that omega quant. That's just a super good idea, why not? Number seven, I'm gonna call hormonal health. And I don't think I'm even gonna say much about it because I've had so many videos that talk about hormonal optimization and how that helps us, particularly estrogen for women, with many things, including osteoporosis prevention, prevention of neurologic decline, protection of the heart, sexual function, not gonna go over that again, but hormonal optimization is critical. And then of course, when we're talking about ovarian hormones for women, it would be estradiol, the type of estrogen that we primarily make, progesterone, the hormone that we make after ovulation, back in the old days when we were fertile, and testosterone, which you now know is even produced in more quantity, higher quantities than estrogen throughout our lives. So those three, and then hormones include a bunch of other things too. So we're measuring insulin. We're looking at thyroid hormone in detail, cortisol, other hormones as well, but primarily regarding menopausal hormones, those big three, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone. Optimizing that 
makes you live longer. I won't go over that again because we've talked about that lots of times before, but don't forget to do that as well on your list of 10 things to do. Number eight, I'm gonna talk for a minute about supplements. And first of all, to say there's no supplement profile that's right for everybody. So whatever I take is not what you should take. Or if anyone tells you everyone should take this or that, that's never true. Uh, so I like to think of supplements this way. Number one, you can get almost everything from food. We were made to get everything we need from food, but then the world changed and the soil lost a lot of nutrients and we live in places where we don't have certain foods available and there's all this crap on the market that's filling our tummies instead of the nutritious food that we were designed to eat. So for various reasons, supplementation might be a really good idea. So I can tell you what I take and that is gonna be meaningless because it might not be the same as what you need. So how to find out what you need? Well, we talk to you about your nutrition, your exercise patterns. Uh, we draw your blood and we check things like your vitamin D level. You can do the omega quant. We check your vitamin B levels. We check homocysteine, which is an indicator of whether you're able to do this process called methylation with your B vitamins. So we check what's going on. We check your ferritin, which is your iron stores, and replace what needs to be replaced. And there are some people who really don't need anything. Um, there's very few because, for example, almost all of us are deficient in magnesium. It's just been depleted from the environment. It's not in our food source much anymore. Almost all of us are deficient in iodine for similar reasons. Most women have low vitamin D unless they're treated because we stay out of the sun. Many women have elevated homocysteine, which requires being treated with a methylated B vitamin. So at the end of the day, most of us end up taking three or four things, but I like to think of them as being targeted to what you actually need. So I take five or six things, but all of them were targeted to exactly what I measured was lower than optimal. And then I addressed it with nutrition if I could, and then with a supplement if I couldn't. And then getting the right brand is just critical. And I'm not paid by any supplement manufacturers, but you do know that I personally take Thorn products uh, just because I trust them. Like we all have our favorite pair of jeans, our favorite brand of shoes. My favorite brand of supplements at the moment is Thorn. <laughs> so if Thorn makes it, I'll get it because they, they're made in the United States. They have very rigorous testing policies. They have third party testing. They have batch testing. They're not outrageously expensive. You can call and talk to the pharmacist, all the things that you would want in a supplement. And there's certainly other brands that are great as well, but make sure that you're using a very reputable brand that you can basically track from the resource that they're making it with to the bottle. And you know everything that happens in between. And that's a great idea. So supplements as needed but by all means get most things from food. Number nine, my favorite topic, sex and intimacy. So we've talked about this a lot. So I talked about it last week. Lots of studies show that intimacy is critical for our health. And, and that could be sexual intercourse or it could be just connection with other humans. So people do not thrive alone or very few do. Loneliness has been found to be as big a risk factor for early death as smoking, for example. So surrounding ourselves with close, intimate people, whether it's your intimate partner or same-sex friends or both, is really, really important. And I'll tell you, it's something that I didn't value enough during the years that I had kids and I was busy being in a nuclear family. That sort of took up all of my time and I lost connection with female friends that I now, thank goodness, have really put a lot of effort into rebuilding. And then intimate partnership, yeah, having a great sex life is good for your health. It just is. And it might not be vaginal intercourse. You might have different preferences, but having an orgasm is really good for you by yourself, with a partner, doesn't matter. It produces a lot of hormones that are great for relaxation, for reducing anxiety, for lowering blood pressure. So uh, sex is great. I recommend we do it as much as we can. And people who have more sex, independent of other things, live longer. And that might be because they've got close connections and friends and other things. But hey, just try it. It's fun. So that's an easy one to add to the list. And if you're someone who's not sexually active right now and thinking, oh, I don't have that available, 
that I need a partner to have an orgasm. So <laughs> don't forget that part of you never goes away. Whether you're single, you've lost your partner, certain situations where you might have depression or be in a place where that doesn't feel important. She's never dead. She's just taking a nap and we can wake her up. So don't forget about that part of your whole well-being. And last but not least, your spiritual life, just having purpose. And this is such a huge topic and so many different opinions about what works for each person. But having some type of purpose in life has been shown in so many studies and countless books to lead to not just more happiness, but also to longevity. So the idea of purpose and meaning has been written about by countless authors. Um, I'm reading a really cool book right now that I highly recommend called Arate. Um, I'll put a picture of it up for you. Um, just having a, a book to read. This one's by Brian Johnson. I just think it's a really great reminder of ways to take action to live into the fullest version of ourselves and to do it now, not to wait, to continue acting with purpose in the service of some higher being, whatever that is to you. Uh, so having some type of active spiritual life really is important. And, you know, just to summarize it in a sentence, I love the idea and I think about it a lot that if you want to feel good, do things that you feel good about. One of my teachers said that. I think it's very valid. So acting in a way that is in line with our intentions about what we feel is in line with our best future self. So if you want to feel good, do things you feel good about. Do things that your future self would be proud of you for doing. And whenever I do that, I feel good. And when I don't do that, I feel terrible. So as an example, if I drink too much and maybe say a snippy text to somebody or gossip or one of the things that is really not in line with what I believe is the best way to live, I feel bad. And I call that karma. So you suffer as a result of your own actions, but you get to change it. So you can wake up the next day and remember, okay, what is it that are my intentions for my best self and act in a way that your best self would be proud of. I like that way of thinking. If you want to feel good about yourself, do things you feel good about. And check out that book by Brian Johnson. Um, I love it. I, I listened to him on a podcast recently and just thought it was very cool. So there's so many out there, but reading good books about positive things uh, goes back a little bit into the what we consume bucket. And I'll just put a plug in for it. Consumption isn't just food. It's everything we take in through all of our senses, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, not just what we eat. So read good things. If you're going to watch TV, watch things that are positive. Know about what's going on in the world. And by all means, don't dig your head in the sand. I like to know what's going on in the news about five minutes a day, but not the doom scrolling. That's not going to lead anywhere positive. Surround yourself with good, positive things. Practice gratitude. It's impossible to be depressed and grateful at the same time. All of those things. So that's number 10, big bucket. Purpose, spiritual life, finding things that are meaningful, surrounding yourself with positive people. That's my number 10. So that sounds like a lot, doesn't it? And we could go way into the weeds in each one of those. In fact, just as a little kind of heads up. Um, in the near future, I'm going to be developing an online series going into the weeds on each one of these things, because each one of these things we could talk for a couple of hours about. And I'm going to do that actually in a video about each one of these things and then make that available as really an educational series for people to access, even if they don't live in Texas and you can't come see me as a patient, because it's so much information. And I personally would love to have it all in one place. I can't find that, so I'm going to make it. So you can look out for that. It'll be hopefully by the summer of 2024, which is this year. So you can have it all in one place and refer to it when you need to. So I know that's a lot of info. Thank you for making it all the way through this video if you did. Um, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe, share it with your friends, uh, write some comments if you want to. I try to answer those if I can, and I can't wait to see you next week.